is our residency program. Um, good group of people. This is down in our simulation lab. Um, we have a good time. Uh, so a big part of it we're going to spend on potassium and sodium. Um, those are going to be the most common things you're going to see uh, disturbances of. We'll talk some about calcium and magnesium as well. A few tests and then a little bit of management in the meantime. So when you guys think about potassium, I want you to think about the kidney. Okay? Most of the things you're going to see abnormal with potassium are going to be from the kidney or it's going to be a fictitious lab result. Okay? So we'll talk about that stuff. But potassium, think about kidney. Uh, I'm from McAllister. Um, we use potassium for something very different in McAllister. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, but we're very uh, familiar with the effects of hyperkalemia. Okay? So hyperkalemia is a serum potassium um, greater than 5.5. Um, can be a pretty significant range. We see a fair number of dialysis patients in the ER and some of them can tolerate potassiums in the 6 range without having any problems whatsoever. If you get higher than 7, you can expect to start seeing some hemodynamic and neurologic changes. Greater than 8, uh, things can get really bad. Right? Um, so potassium should be outside of, or I'm sorry, it should be inside the cells. Okay? Normally potassium lives in your cell. 90% um, of it in fact. Um, that ratio is what helps your cells do what your cells do. When that gets messed up, they have problems doing what they do, i.e. McAllister. So, um, also 95% of it is excreted um, through the kidneys. So remember I said when you think potassium, think about the kidneys. Most of this is going to happen um, at the distal nephron um, in the collecting duct. Okay? So, uh, When we talk about potassium being intracellular, uh, not all cells are created equal. So muscle is where you're going to have most of it. So uh, with significant muscle damage, you can get a leakage of a significant amount of potassium. Um, you've got some in bone, some in liver, um, some in red blood cells, which we'll talk in a minute about why that's important. When it comes to excretion, remember the kidney's the big player, but also you can have some with GI loss with people who are having significant diarrhea. Um, they can actually lose a fair amount of potassium um, that way. Okay, so remember I said the most common thing is going to be a kidney problem or it's probably an error. So lab error is very common. Um, I also said red blood cells have some potassium in them. So if you break them open, then it can be uh, falsely elevated. So we see that frequently. Somebody um, draws lab through an IV that's too small, um, hemolyzes blood, uh, lab calls and says we have a critical uh, lab value, potassium's 9, their creatinine's 0.8, and we say, well, that just doesn't seem like this 16-year-old would have that. Uh, let's recheck it, okay? So you should recheck abnormal potassium just to make sure that you're actually dealing with uh, a true lab value. Um, also, if a lab gets drawn and left on the counter, sits around for a couple hours, and then gets sent down, you can get them all. Most of your labs should do a test and tell you that they are they're suspicious for hemolysis. Um, but if it's an outpatient lab, maybe you don't have a great relationship, whatever, you may not know exactly what their protocol is. So um, hyperkalemia can be significant, so um, you know, err on the side of caution with it. Um, also with acidosis, so remember I said it should be inside the cell, but potassium has a positive charge. There's another ion in your body that has a positive charge, hydrogen. Um, if you get too much hydrogen when you're in an acidotic state, the cells will try uh, to correct some of that. So they will take in a hydrogen, but when they do that, they have to get rid of something to equalize it, so they put out a potassium. So if you have uh, an acidotic state, such as uh, you know, renal failure or DKA, um, you can end up with a elevated serum potassium, although your total body potassium hasn't changed. You just shifted it out of the cell. We'll come back to that shifting as well here in a little bit when we talk about treatment. Okay? I mentioned uh, you know if you have damage to muscle, you can end up with an elevated potassium. So any kind of cell death, so somebody that gets burns um, can have uh, 
and elevated potassium. And then there's a whole host of medications. As you can imagine, if you take potassium, your potassium can go up. Um, generally speaking, the bowel tries not to kill you, um, and it usually will not absorb enough to make you really sick. Um, but uh, if somebody's on potassium and their potassium level is marginal, they should certainly hold that. Propranolol can cause it. Succinylcholine gets talked about a lot um, in emergency medicine. That's our big paralytic that we use. Um, they do recommend caution in um, patients who may potentially have hyperkalemia. Um, so dialysis patients, you might want to choose rocuronium, which is a different paralytic. Um, you also read about burn patients. The one thing I would caution you all with that, that's a burn patient that's several hours down the road. Okay, So if I jumped in a vat of hot grease right now and you drug me out and innovated me, my potassium should be okay at that point. Um, but this evening, um, you probably should avoid potassium or avoid suction of um, Digoxin, um, elevated digoxin levels and uh, hyperkalemia can potentiate each other. And I'll show you a case of that here in a few minutes, but um, it can be really bad. Um, anybody know potassium sparing diuretics, what that might be? Good. So spironolactone. Not used quite as much. For a while, that was a mainstay of uh, CHF treatment. We don't use it as much now, but they do use it some for uh, acne treatment. Um, sometimes they'll put, uh, put people on spironolactone. So you'll see that a little bit. ACE inhibitors uh, can interfere with the kidney's ability to extrude it as well. Um, pentamidine and uh, trimethoprim can cause it. Um, you might think about that. When I see those two medicines together, the first thing I think of is HIV. So if you have an HIV patient, then you may know, think of um, So yeah, we really talked about all this already. So pseudo-hyperkalemia, if you get a lab value that seems out of whack, um, remember that you're smarter than a lab test, and uh, you may need to replace that or recheck that before you start aggressively treating it. Um, in the right situation, assume that it's high. But in the case I mentioned, you know, a 16 year old, you figure he's got normal kidneys, and that's probably not real. Um, so, again, I'm from McAllister. We worry about EKG changes when you uh, have hyperkalemia. Uh, you can get peak T waves, widening of your QRS. Um, you can lose your P wave, uh, eventually a sine wave. Uh, you can also make the uh, myocardium irritable, go into AFib, um, and of course, the always terminal asystole. Uh, I'll show you in a minute um, the way I remember this. Um, here's where you can start to see these changes. So, uh, you know, five and a half, six and a half, you might start seeing some peaking of your T waves. Six and a half to eight, you start losing uh, your P waves and you start to get some prolongation. And then over eight, it's starting to get pretty severe. All right, so here's another example of it. Um, different leads, but you can see at the bottom, in my red pointer, uh, how it can just slowly progress to lengthen out. This is the way I think of it, is if I were able to take that EKG tracing, grab the line and slowly pull it and stretch it out, um, that's what happens. So first you pull up, so you get your peak T wave, and then you start to just slowly widen everything out. That P wave doesn't have much tension on it. It flattens out first. Your QRS starts to widen, and then you can end up with the sine wave. Um, so your management, the first thing we want to do is try and stabilize that membrane. So we have to use another cation in order to do that. Uh, then we want to try and shift as much of that potassium inside the cell and hide it until we can figure out what to do with it. Um, and then we got to find some way to get it out of the body. So calcium is the cation that we use to try and stabilize the, uh, particularly the uh, myocyte cell membrane. Um, so it varies depending on your patient's clinical picture. For me, if they've got hyperkalemia and their EKG looks funny, um, I give calcium. Um, it's just the, the risk of untreated hyperkalemia and arrhythmias is just too great. Um, you'll see some guidelines here. They talk about if it's over 6.5, um, but then if their EKG changes regardless of the plasma level, um, you should give it. 
There are a couple of different ways that you can give it. Um, when I was in medical school, all they ever hammered on us was calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate. So I got out and was all ready for calcium gluconate, and they said, why are you giving calcium gluconate? I said, because that's what you give. Did you <laughs> no. And uh, they said, no, give calcium chloride. And it's wah, wah, wah. <laughs> this is the thing I was ready to treat. Um, so calcium chloride actually has three times as much calcium in it as calcium gluconate. The problem with it is, um, you really probably should be giving it through a central line. Um, it's uh, irritating to the veins, it extravasates, uh, it's a real mess. Um, but if you do have a central line, um, calcium chloride is what you ought to get. Calcium gluconate can be given through a peripheral line. Um, but remember, you're not getting as much bang for your buck out of it. Taking a test, unless it says which one of these has more calcium in it, the answer is probably just going to be calcium. I don't know your test writer well, but I wouldn't suspect that you would want to trick them that much. Um, so stabilizing cardiac membrane, membranes, you need calcium. Um, oh, there's pearl. Okay, uh, so it's got three times as much calcium per volume as calcium glucose. Um, then we want to try and shift it inside the cell. So. Um, Remember I talked about that hydrogen um, ion, so your body tries to um, hide the hydrogen, so what we want to do is try and correct that. So if we give insulin and glucose, that actually works on the same transporter, and so you can get some potassium back in the cell out of the serum where it's dangerous. Um, albuterol or salmeterol does the same thing. Um, and then calcium bi or sodium bicarbonate obviously um, would help treat the acidosis. So those things all try to shift it back into the cells um, while you can start working on ways to get rid of it. Um, another, so the ways to get rid of it, uh, Kate Exalate um, has been used for a long time. Um, I'll tell you because of the last dot there, the risk of uh, colon necrosis, which any Here's a pearl. Anytime you see necrosis, that's something bad. There's no good thing with necrosis. So, um, colonic necrosis has been reported with KX Lake, particularly if it has sorbitol with it. Um, so, it's fallen a little bit out of favor. Um, that being said, a lot of nephrologists still really love it and want you to give uh, a bunch of KX Lake. Um, my thought as an ER doctor is um, that's not going to happen real fast anyway. So what it does is try to bind it up in the bowel, keep you from reabsorbing it, and then help you poop it out. That's a fairly slow process. Um, I don't jump on that rapidly. I wait and go ahead and give my Lasix, talk with the nephrologist. If they say, I don't think they need dialysis, I want you to give the x -Lay. Then I give the x -Lay and just document why I'm giving it. Um, obviously, Lasix, um, you know, anytime you put somebody on a loop diuretic, you got to worry about them getting hypokalemic, so you usually have to give them potassium supplementation. So this would be a good way to help pee it out. Obviously, if that patient's all of a sudden now got a creatinine of four, that's not going to be terribly effective. In which case, that's when you do hemodialysis, right? So dialysis is very effective at getting rid of it, um, but not rapid. So you got to get a dialysis line put in. You got to get your dialysis nurse in there, and you got to get orders. But that may be the only way uh, that you can treat it. Um, yeah, so this is a study. Uh, ACE inhibitors and trimethoprim were the most common medication um, causes. Uh, reduced kidney function was seen in 70% of the patients. Um, and an EKG. Uh, was performed in 44% of the study patients, which seems very low to me, but as an ER doctor, everybody gets an EKG. Um, and potassium related uh, findings were seen in 50% uh, of the patients, despite levels of 6.5 or higher. So, uh, like I said, some of our dialysis patients tolerate hyperkalemia pretty well. Um, a lot of it just has to, do, has to do with how quickly they got there. Um, so, this is an EKG of a patient that I actually had. Um, so this guy was on digoxin and uh, taking potassium uh, and Lasix. Uh, had not been feeling well, had been thrown up and having some diarrhea. 
got volume depleted, went into renal failure. Um, and as you can see here in this uh, rhythm strip at the bottom, uh, that is very close to a sine wave. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so digoxin and potassium together um, can potentiate their effects. Um, this was his second EKG because I didn't think I really believed the first one. Um, turns out it was real. Um, there's a medicine you can give to bind up digoxin. Um, it's called Digibind. Really, that's what it's called. Um, so he got Digibind and we aggressively treated his um, hyperkalemia. Is that all medications aren't in right now? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a mantra that if somebody's on digoxin, you should not give them calcium because it can cause a stone heart. Um, so there's some thought that if you give calcium to a digoxin patient, um, you get too much calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum and then it won't beat and the heart just stops. Truthfully, that's probably been shown that it really doesn't happen. Um, but you may hear that, and I would just recommend having some caution. This guy actually did not get calcium. This was quite a few years ago. Um, but we treated him with um, some fluids, some Lasix, bicarb, everything else. And um, this was his EKG uh, just a couple hours later. So um, he started to narrow back up and um, actually lived and um, was discharged from the hospital. That's an EKG that you won't you will see, uh, hopefully not ever in your career, but even on the internet, that's that's a pretty scary one. Okay, so uh, if you like mnemonics, here's a mnemonic to help remind you how to treat uh, hyperkalemia. Um, C big K dye, so calcium, um, bicarb, beta agonist, insulin, glucose, um, KX elate, and um, LASIK. Uh, a lot of people want to or, uh, pronounce it like eye surgery, but it's LASIK, not LASIK. Um, and then dialysis, right? Um, and to recap, causes the hyperkalemia, make sure that it's not just a lab of error. Um, get an EKG, check the changes. Um, if it's greater than 6.5, start getting aggressive. Um, and don't forget to look for what's causing it. So sometimes what we have a tendency to do is order lab tests and say, ha, ah, I found an abnormality, but then we stop. Um, so remember that you've got to try and figure out why it's happening. Um, did this patient just get volume depleted because they were outside building the fence, um, or do they have some other cause that, uh, other thing that's causing their renal failure? All right, any questions about hyperkalemia? No? Perfect. Um, hypokalemia. So if you don't have enough potassium, that's bad too. Um, so less than 3.5 at most uh, labs is going to be um, hypokalemia. Severe hypokalemia, less than 2.5 um, is more worser. Um, and it can potentially cause uh, life-threatening imbalance. Um, and in some cases, it may even be iatrogenically induced. Um, so the symptoms that your patient's going to present with is going to be generalized weakness fatigue, um, in severe cases even some respiratory muscle um, fatigue, um, so causes, um, usually it's going to be a medication, um, either a thiazide or some loop diuretic, furosemide or lysine being the most common, also GI symptoms, um, you know, somebody that's having severe vomiting and diarrhea can get hypokalemia. <coughs> Also, if they're starting to have endocrine abnormalities, um, they can get wasting of it. Um, they have acidosis abnormalities. Uh, renal tubular defects can lead to wasting of potassium. Um, and then magnesium deficiency. Um, other causes, so just decreased intake, which is fairly rare in the US. Um, intake is usually not our problem as Americans. Um, increased loss, uh, so um, nephrotic syndromes, dehydration, and renal tubular acidosis. Um, I think we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, GI losses, um, and then uh, diuretics. Uh, is this tracking along with what you guys are looking at? Okay. I think this might be the one from last year, but that's fine. 
some arrhythmias, EKG changes. Um, uh, muscle weakness is going to be the biggest thing, which is kind of a pain in the rear as an ER doctor. We hate everything that's, uh, I just feel weak because there's really no great uh, differential for that it's, as long as you're booked. Um, so uh, uh, also, just as we said, metabolic acidosis can cause hyperkalemia. Metabolic alkalosis can cause hypokalemia. Well, the list of things that cause metabolic alkalosis is it's fairly short. It's fairly unusual. Um, so uh, one interesting thing, um, toluene can cause a type 1 renal tubular acidosis and they get potassium wasting. The most profound hypokalemic patients I've seen have been because of toluene. You guys know where somebody might get that? What group of patients? So huffers. Um, so uh, people that huff paint or huff glue. Um, can get a renal tubular acidosis and can get really profound hypokalemia. Um, if somebody comes in and smells like a can of spray paint and um, they're complaining that they feel weak, um, be sure to check the potassium and check the renal function. Uh, just another aside, um, the, the paints that have the highest concentration of it are the metallic color. So if somebody you know, has silver or gold or even the coppery, bronzy kind of color on their fingers, um, and you're suspicious of it, um, you're probably right. Uh, we had a guy come in one day that looked like the Tin Man from the Lord of the Rings. <coughs> just denied and denied and denied that he'd been doing anything. Um, but I would, the, if you go rule to your ER rotation, go to Walmart and go to the paint section, and if they have it locked up, then you know you're in a high area of <laughs> Yeah. And, and we had, for a while, it seemed like we had a lot in Oklahoma City. Um, either that generation died off or people were spending something else, or they're probably all getting their marijuana cards. Now. We, we don't seem to see as many huffers. I used to joke, though, that, I mean, huffers were at least a pleasant group. Meth addicts were kind of a pain in the butt to deal with, but meth, or huffers all were pretty pleasant. They didn't have many neurons that were still working, but they at least were cordial when they liked to be done. Um, so uh, EKG changes usually start somewhere around 2.7 um, on your lap value. Uh, you start to get PR prolongation, some T wave flattening inversion, maybe ST segment compression, and then the U wave. So I always remember that if you were under potassium, you would get a U wave. Um, I've seen that before, uh, but the one patient that I saw it on was a patient who was on a bicarb drip for a tricyclic uh, antidepressant overdose, and they had gotten his uh, serum, um, his pH up high enough that it finally drove the potassium down, and um, he had an actual U wave. Just gave him some potassium. Uh, good, so you can see there's a U wave, so you know, I got to keep it simple, so it's STU. So uh, if, something, if you have a wave after your T um, that doesn't look like it's starting over at P, then it's a, it's a U wave. Generally, you can replace these patients orally. Um, just give them some, um, KDUR is a brand name that's been around for a long time. Um, but giving them oral potassium is usually sufficient. Um, if you do end up needing to give IV potassium, uh, remember McAllister, don't give it too fast. Get it slow. Um, again, preferably this would be through a central line, although you can do it through a peripheral. Um, generally, your pharmacy uh, is going to have some policy that regulates how fast you can give IV potassium. Uh, we can't give more than 20 an hour peripherally, um, which is probably a good reason. 40 uh, milliequivalents per hour if you do have a central line. Okay? Uh, your goal is to get them up to four, four and a half. Um, Then also remember, anytime you have a profoundly hypokalemic patient, um, that you need to check their magnesium. Okay, so particularly um, alcoholic patients who may be hypomagnesemic, you won't be able to get their potassium up um, until you get their magnesium up. So uh, short of a patient who comes in that's you know taking 80 milligrams of Lasix a day and is hypokalemic, um, I'm probably going to check a mag as well. Uh, 
just to make sure uh, that I'm not missing anything there. Um, yeah, so there are some calculators for it. Uh, if you want to calculate their total body um, potassium. Um, in hyperkalemia, oftentimes they don't really have much of a change in their total body potassium. Um, it's just a shift. However, with hypokalemia, a lot of times it actually is that they've had a change uh, in their total body potassium. One thing that's always been a little bit interesting and, and confusing, have you guys covered diabetic ketoacidosis? Mm -hmm. Right, so what do you guys know about potassium in DKA? I have uh, no, we'll get to that in a minute. Right, so early on when the patient's severely acidotic, what happens to the potassium? It goes out so when it's low. So this the cells say, give me a hydrogen, I'm gonna get rid of this potassium, right? So your serum potassium goes up. Now assuming that they don't have kidney failure yet, what does the kidney do when it says, my gosh, there's a lot of potassium coming out? It says, hey, let's get rid of this. Yeah. So it starts peeing it all off. Then the potassium level may come back down to normal. You check your lab and think, hey, wow, great, their potassium is normal. I just need to give them um, some uh, insulin and correct their acidosis. Well, as you correct that acidosis, it shifts back in the cell and they get hypokalemia. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a, a, a quandary whenever you're dealing with DKA, but oftentimes if they've been in, seem to have been in it for very long, um, you're probably going to end up replacing it, with, even if their potassium is normal. Okay? But you do want to make sure that they uh, have urinated beforehand, because you want to make sure that they're making urine um, before you give them potassium. Um, so think about diuretics, diarrhea, get an EKG, um, less than two, they should be profoundly symptomatic. And then 50% um, of the time, uh, hypomagnesemia and hypokalemia uh, run around together. So then the next one um, in your electrolyte panel, sodium is the next big thing, okay? So we said potassium was primarily in the cell. Sodium is primarily outside of the cell, okay? And, and just like I mentioned, when the, uh, whenever you think about uh, potassium, I want you to think about the kidney. When you think about sodium, I want you to think about water. Um, so really it has a lot to do with your free water uh, intake and free water excretion. Um, so it moves in and out according to osmolality. Uh, there's also uh, sodium potassium ATPase um, at play. Um, so renin um, works on the kidneys. Tell your ki tell your kidneys, you know, conserve free water, don't conserve free water. Anything that uh, throws that out of balance uh, can obviously alter your uh, sodium as well. Antidiuretic hormone um, plays a huge role in this. It increases uh, your renal water reabsorption, and tons of medicines and things that we do uh, can impact and alter that. All right. I'll give you guys a little uh, pearl too. I always tell our residents if you're ever getting pimps or taking a test, if uh, it says what's the most common cause worldwide, the answer is TB. It doesn't matter what it's asking about. And if it's what's the most common cause in the United States, it's iatrogenic. Um, it doesn't matter what they're asking about. So for the most part, these are going to be things that have been thrown out of whack because the medicine we put people on. When you think about sodium, think about water. Potassium, it's the kidney. Sodium, it has to do with your water. Um, so this would be a typical patient that we see, 85-year-old male, decreased level of consciousness at home, history of dementia, still takes care of himself pretty well, found in urine, um, appears to have bitten his tongue, <coughs> vital signs there, his GCS, lab calls, and he's got a serum sodium of 103. So this would be something that we see um, relatively commonly. Um, so older patients, they're on tons of medicines. Um, particularly in the summertime, they don't like those electric bills, so sometimes they let their houses get too hot, um, and they come in altered. Um, they've got a history of dementia, and now I'm trying to figure out is this new different, or is this kind of how different they always are. Uh, but it obviously helps when life calls and gives you a sodium like that. So hyponatremia is a serum sodium less than 135. Um, and you mentioned you needed to correct for what? Glucose. Glucose, right. 
So uh, just, again, I'm not a nephrologist, I'm just an ER doctor. So uh, you get about a 1.6 millimole change for every uh, 100 um, milligrams per deciliter your glucose is over 100. There's a more complicated formula, I'm sure, um, but that's one I can do in my head. So um, about one and a half for every 100 over 100 uh, to correct it. Remember, sodium is usually extracellular, so it's the major osmotic pull um, outside of protein in your uh, serum until glucose gets involved and then it can overwhelm it and that's how you get your pseudo hyponatremia. Um, so a couple of key questions is what's the patient's neurologic status and then what's their volume status. Um, also again wonder if this is a lab error. Again if it's a 16 year old that they call and say hey their sodium is 103 and they're watching sports center in the room then it's probably an area you need to find out what happened. Um, sometimes people will accidentally draw a lab distal to an ID that's maybe, maybe running in um, some normal saline or D5 half normal saline and that can cause abnormalities. Um, also hyperlipidemia and hyperproteinemia. Again, similarly, those take over as an osmotic uh, pressure and can pull in um, fluid. Uh, mannitol would, would do the same thing. Okay. Then it gets into breaking hyponatremia up into three different categories. So there's hypervolemic, eubolemic, and hypovolemic um, uh, hyponatremia. So hypervolemic hyponatremia is really based on your clinical findings. So if you walk in and the patient looks to be wet, they're edematous, um, their mucous membranes don't look dried out, um, you know, they've got swelling in their ankles, um, and then you think, all right, this patient's hypervolemic hyponatremia. Probably going to be CHF, renal failure, kidney disease, something like that that's causing it. If you look at them and say, well, they seem okay, they don't have a bunch of edema, their mouth doesn't look too dry, that's probably a euvolemic hyponatremia. Um, so you get increased ADH secondary to some physiologic stress. Um, that leads to your hyponatremia. Um, one of my favorite diagnoses here is beer potomania. So um, if somebody goes on a bender on the weekend, bedlam maybe, um, on Monday they can have some hyponatremia uh, from it um, as it may mess up their uh, uh, ADH. And then there's hypovolemic. So that patient obviously looks dry, and we think this is a patient whose volume is bleeding, um, and they just don't have enough water, uh, I'm sorry, they just don't have enough sodium. So they've lost more sodium than water, but have still lost a lot of uh, water, all right? Frankly, these are things that you learn for your test and know them. Um, clinically, at least from the ER standpoint, you start these treatments all the same, and you talk with the nephrologist. Um, it's style points if you can say, hey, I think they're just volume overloaded from their nephrotic syndrome. Um, but really, we treat them the same way. If you guys are podcast listeners, um, there's a big ER podcast called EM Crit. Um, Scott Weingart does it. He has an excellent podcast on hyponatremia, um, and he gives you some rules. Um, for how to treat it. Uh, I generally don't recommend just do something because this is what somebody says. That podcast is one that if I have a hyponatremic patient, I pull up his show notes and just kind of do what he says to do. Um, and uh, in it, his first rule is uh, you know, treat CNS problems. Um, then his second rule is order a bunch of labs and then don't do anything. And then his next one is what to do if you couldn't do the last step. Um, so we have a tendency sometimes where doctors, uh, we want to do something, um, and sometimes doing nothing uh, is the better thing. So really volume uh, restriction um, is the most important thing for these patients. Um, and he goes through an example of how with even just one liter of normal saline, you can turn off their uh, antidiuretic hormone. All of a sudden they get this free water diuresis, and you can correct their sodium faster than you intended. Um, this is probably a more readable breakdown of all the different causes for the different types. Um, 
SIADH uh, is pretty interesting, and I remember in medical school I thought, well, that's kind of crazy, I won't ever see that. But this actually probably happens quite a bit. Um, it's probably caused a lot more from medications that we give. Um, most recently I had a patient that was super frustrating, so uh, had a hish, well, actually that's not true. I forget I'm not talking to JDDR doctor. She was a very pleasant person. I was frustrated that I didn't pick this up right away. So the whole thing got labeled as frustrating. But um, it was a patient who had a seizure disorder and was on Tegretol. Um, she had a seizure. Well, the thing with people with, that have seizures is they tend to have seizures. So um, I didn't get too excited about it. Um, she seemed to have come around pretty well, talked with her. Um, she uh, may have missed her morning dose of Tegretol, may not have, not really sure. Um, kind of him hot around, family gets there, and then, you know, hours later, we're like, well, let's just, you know, check and see what, let's just check some lab. And her sodium came back at like 118. Um, so Tegretol can cause SIADH, um, but the frustrating thing is, if you have a low sodium, you can have a seizure, but that's somebody that's on medicine because they have seizures. So um, that's one medicine that, that I think you, you should remember, because it, it can cause it fairly commonly. Obviously, diuretic can cause it as well, because that's what most common cause worldwide, I'm sure, is TB. <laughs> um, so they'll come in lethargic, um, may have uh, nausea, vomiting, generalized weakness, um, can have even some focal neurologic deficits, but seizures and altered mental status are really the big things that we need to see. Um, uh, less than 125, they can start to have symptoms. Um, less than 120, the risk of seizure really starts to go up. Um, one caveat to that is it depends on how quickly they got there. Um, so if this is somebody who has been getting hyponatremic over several weeks to months, um, they can tolerate it uh, to a much lower level than somebody that just got there over the last couple of days. Um, yeah, always consider a serum sodium abnormality in patients with altered level of consciousness. Acute hyponatremia, they usually have symptoms less than 120, uh, and chronic can tolerate it at, at much lower levels. Um, so with no neurologic symptoms, um, if they're hypovolemic and you need to resuscitate them, you can give them IV fluid. Otherwise, <coughs> put in a saline lock, uh, make them NPO, put in a Foley so you can monitor their output. Um, and remember that uh, replacing potassium can actually increase your sodium as well um, through that sodium potassium ATPase. And so you have to figure that in whenever you start replacing it. Some of the labs that are recommended in the patient that's hyponatremic, um, check a CBC. Obviously, there are other electrolytes. That's how you found that out. If you can check their serum osmolality, or their yeah, serum and urine osmolality, it might give you an idea um, if they are volume overloaded, eubolemic, or hypovolemic. Um, check a uric acid. Um, it can affect the renal tubule, tubule. and then a TSH and a cortisol level. Um, just to give you an idea of what their uh, endocrine status would be like. Um, urine electrolytes can again let you know if they're uh, concentrating their urine um, and then a the urine creat. This comes pretty much right off Scott Weingart's uh, suggestion. And a lot of these tests take a while to come back. So from the ER side, I'm ordering this and then telling the nephrologist, hey, I got some lab coming for you. You should follow it up. Um, this kind of restates some of the stuff that we talked about earlier. Um, it's probably worth looking at on your own rather than me going over it all again. Um, so when do you give uh, emergent treatment if they have neurologic impairment, um, if they're seizing, um, ultra level of consciousness or uh, comatose, you can actually give what we in the biz call hot salt, uh, which is 3% saline uh, to replace their sodium to get it up to a safe level. Um, generally, a rule of sixes um, is, is pretty well accepted. So you shouldn't increase the, you should plan on increasing their serum sodium by six milliequivalents per day. Um, if they have neurologic symptoms, you can raise it by six in six hours. You guys know why you would want to be so careful? What? Good. So, uh, oh, maybe we'll get to it here in just a minute. So, there's the. That's how you can give hot salt. 
Um, 3%, uh, 100 cc's over 20 minutes. If they don't improve, you can repeat it. Um, each 100 should raise it by about 2 mil equivalents, um, and then you stop. And don't do anything. If their symptoms continue, then you may need to get a hit CT and make sure you're not missing something. So, um, osmotic demyelination syndrome, I guess is the new name for it. Um, so, you're right. So, you can demyelinate their brain, which patients generally don't like. Um, and uh, that's why we don't want to correct it too rapidly. If you're correct it more than 10 mil equivalents in a 24 hour period, you're at increased risk of doing that. Um, you can see there are some other risk factors. Uh, the lower the sodium, the greater the risk. If it's been chronic, uh, alcoholics, and malnutrition. Um, so in his step about what to do, if you couldn't do the last step, you can actually give some BDADP um, to uh, begin to retain uh, some free water uh, to try and help slow down uh, that correction. Yeah, so we used to call this central pontine myelinolysis, and now it's apparently changed to osmotic demyelination syndrome. Um, this kind of talks about the same things we just talked about. Um, so in hypovolemic hyponatremia, you can correct their volume deficit, but I would stop there. Um, in the eubolemic hyponatremia, um, again, free water restriction. <laughs> They're hypervolemic, obviously there, it makes sense to restrict their fluid and then cautious use of diuretics. Again, I would do this in post uh, consultation with the nephrologist. <laughs> all right, another case, 85-year-old male, altered. Oh no, this is the case from earlier. Right um, so since he's, oops, that won't help you guys. Uh, with neurologic impairment, um, in this guy, I would recommend going ahead and giving um, a little bolus of hot salt. Um, may require a second one and monitor their electrolytes. Um, but don't give any additional food. Okay, this is another case. 62 year old female presents no debonging diarrhea, confused for the last 24 hours, has a history of diabetes, hypertension, CHF, lung cancer, is on Zoloft, hydrochloric diazide. Um, so, what do you do? So you check some electrolytes, right? Mm -hmm. But we see this all the time, okay? So long list of medical problems, on medicines. So if you look here, these are all the things just in this short little description that could cause her to be hyponatremic. And then she enjoys raves. Um, so also ecstasy. Ecstasy can cause hyponatremia as well. Okay, so they can get a lot of free water loss and then apparently I'm told, um, drink a lot of water uh, at raves uh, whenever they use ecstasy. So those patients can be hypotremic um, and altered, as well as other reasons that they're altered. Um, so only correct sodium if they are having neurologic symptoms. You can give hot salt. Remember your rule of six. Don't cause osmotic demyelination syndrome. If you overcorrect, you can use DDABP and then acquire the problems. All right? Hypernatremia um, is a state of hyperosmolality, okay? So oftentimes what this is, and we see it in the emergency department, is uh, a debilitated patient, not really controlling their own uh, access to water, um, who uh, has been uh, volume depleted, not getting free water, uh, and their serum sodium will go up as they begin to concentrate. Um, Again, these are usually patients who are on medicines that can cause it as well. Um, so they have reduced water intake or they have increased water loss. Um, it's rare, but they can have increased sodium intake. But with good kidney function, generally those patients can get rid of it. But do think about it in patients on exogenous uh, corticosteroids or if they have adrenal uh, hyperplasia, because that can induce it as well. How long do we have? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is most commonly in debilitated patients um, who depend on others for hydration. Like I said, so you generally see this in patients from some type of long-term care facility who, uh, you know, maybe don't like to, don't eat or drink much for themselves and hasn't been offered and, and they 
you sit there and get your iron. Do you guys need a break? Yeah? Okay. Ready? Break. <laughs>